this webinar. Our topic is designing your farmer's market booth. The Cultivating Success Program was established in 2000 by University of Idaho Extension, the nonprofit organization Rural Roots, and the Washington State University Food Systems Program. Just a couple of webinar tips this morning. If you're having any trouble with your bandwidth, it could be helpful to close the other programs that are running on your computer. If you're having problems with sound, you can also always type into the chat box, which you'll find in the control bar at the bottom of your screen. Myself and Mackenzie Lawrence are standing by to help you with technical issues. In your welcome email, there's a phone number that you can call in and use the telephone for your audio. If you decide to do that, please mute your computer sound so that you don't get feedback. At any time during the presentation, you can type questions for Diane into the Q&A box. That's our preferred place for questions. We'll have some time throughout the webinar to answer those questions. This webinar is being recorded and the slide handout as well as the recording will be available through the Cultivating Success website. At the end of the webinar, I will show you where to find that link. I'm really excited to have my friend and long-term colleague Diane Green from Green Tree Naturals in Sandpoint be our, present our presenter this morning. Diane is one of the co-founders of the Cultivating Success Program and has been an amazing farmer mentor through the program as well as to many interns on her own farm in Sandpoint. She's an amazing marketer, has taught so many marketing workshops and classes over the last 20 plus years. We're really delighted that you could be here today and we appreciate, Diane, you sharing your vast wealth of farmer's market experience. And thanks for the opportunity to share again. So I'll try sharing the screen. Perfect. Yay, it worked. Yes. I never know if these things are going to work. I am computer challenged at best, but um, so happy to be here with you guys today. I need to move forward a little bit here. There we go. Ah. I was kind of hoping it'd be a rainy day. It's a lot easier to be inside on a rainy day, but um, nonetheless, we'll be out by the time it warms up enough to get out there and do something. So just a quick overview about Green Tree Naturals, and you can learn more than you ever wanted to know by going to our website, but we, we've been making our living by what we grow and sell on our farm for almost 30 years now. I don't know how that happened, but we have gone through a lot of different phases of, of what we grow and produce. We just added growing seed crops a couple of years ago and I'm pretty excited about that. And we continue expanding our collection of value added products. But after 28 years of selling at the farmer's market at Sandpoint, I officially retired from there in 2018 to start selling full-time at our farm stand, which has been a, a really wonderful transition and I'm really happy to be doing that. But we sell our, our certified organic produce to local restaurants, uh, natural food store. We have a small CSA and um, the farm stand is our main thing and we, only, we are only open from July, August, September. And that's, that's been a, a really nice transition after 28 years at the farmer's market to be able to stay home. Because I'm, I'm now officially a senior citizen and have been for a while. So uh, while I haven't retired from farming, I've retired from the farmer's market. But it was a, a, a long, interesting journey over the years of learning about marketing. So here on the left, You'll see my first uh, official marketing endeavor in 1980, that was in Victor, Colorado. I somehow thought selling watermelon juice would be a great idea. I 
I might have sold uh, two cups of watermelon juice and ended up having a, a really good time, but didn't make any money at it. But so I've I've done a lot of craft shows and a lot of different things over the years. But when um, I was invited to bring my crafts because I was doing craft shows here in Sandpoint in the early or the late 80s and I was invited to sell at the farmer's market and that picture on the right was my first year at the Sandpoint farmer's market and why that was only the second year that the market was open and when we started the farmer's market in Sandpoint there were only 10 vendors Initially, I was just selling garden crafts and excess produce. And then after a couple of years at the market, we started expanding our gardens and eventually turned uh, a hobby into a way of a more sustainable lifestyle. And then over the 28 years as a farmer market vendor, I observed and made a lot of changes. And when I officially retired from the farmer's market in 2018, the market hosted over 50 vendors. So quite a transition over, over those years. I, I saw a lot of things change and it's, it's wonderful that our farmer's market has grown to what it has. And this was in the last year that I was at the market. And I, I love teaching, I've taught a lot of classes on selling at farmer's market and, and in the process of going going through creating this, I kind of spent a lot of time looking at other presentations that I'd done. And I, I realized that when it comes to designing your farmer's market booth, which was the topic of this today's presentation, that a lot of the process is just about marketing. And there's plenty of options for how you can set things up. But when it comes down to it, it's how you display things and what your signs look like and how you interact with your customers. And all of that is a part of having a successful experience of selling at the farmer's market. And with so many vendors selling the same type of produce, your display can make all the difference of having customers choose to buy from you or the other guy. Our location in North Idaho really limits what we can grow. So it's typical for everyone to have a lot of the same thing, especially in the spring, lots of greens like chard and kale and spinach and lettuce and arugula. So how you design your farmer's market booth is really has a great impact on how farmers feel about it and how they make a decision to choose to buy from you or not. I think that most of, the, most of the people that come to the farmer's market want to estab establish a connection with the farmers and know where their food comes from. And when it comes down to it, offering a quality product is only a part of being successful at the market. It's really about developing relationships with your customers. So I'm going to share some lessons learned along with some ideas that hopefully will help you develop a loyal following at the farmer's market. Market research is really um, a part of the process. It's really, it can be a positive and profitable experience, but it's different than other methods of sales. If you haven't sold at a farmer's market before, it's a good idea to start by doing some basic research. And by that, I mean, looking at what other people are doing. Um, if you can come up with something different, do that. It's more in how you present that. For growing in northern Idaho, we're pretty limited to a lot of things that we do without, unless if you use season extension to do things like that, it'll really make a difference. But no matter what you're selling, arranging your products in an eye-catching manner really makes them more appealing to customers. And the basic principles of marketing apply for selling at farmer's markets. So thinking about, uh, I mean, I, I have found over the years that one of the best things I could do was, was spend some time doing that market research by visiting at least three farmer's markets and 
in the in the area, walk around with a notepad and make note of make clear observations and make note of what attracts you to that particular booth as a customer. What do you like and what what don't you like about those different booths? Um, it, it's really when you see if you see a lot of people standing in line for something, why do you think people are there? I mean, you, you need to do some homework and really take a closer look at what's being sold, how much are they charging, kind of looking at, at all those kind of things. And that's, that's really important that you assess what's out there and consider doing, you, you're probably not going to be able to do something too different as far as what you can grow because there's limitations to our, in our growing environment, but doing some market research and really thinking about who your customer is will make a difference. And in Sandpoint, during the tourist season, which is Memorial to Labor Day, pretty much, it's the tourists are buying a very different product. And that's important to target that. And it's important to, to really listen closely to what conversations are being had at your booth. That has really influenced me over the years of what I sold and how I sold it when when I'd have a customer standing there and they'd be having a conversation about well I'd, I'd really like to buy some of this but I'm you know we're traveling we don't have much boy I'd love to buy, buy some of those flowers but um, they'll, they'll wilt if I have them in my car um, I, I always kept a, a notebook a little spiral at my farm at my stand at the farmer's market and when I heard comments I wrote them down and whether they were buying from me or not and this is a, a customer that had I remember him coming the first time and he was a long-term customer for many years came asking you know I just want a little bit of everything I wish it was all packaged together so I because of his comment I started making stir fry specials and that's something that was unique. It took more time for me to bag those up, but I would sell out of those every week. And it was, uh, it was a customer's idea, really, that put that in my head. Customers love signs and explanations. I think it's really important that you take the time to help your customers be informed shoppers. I love the sign one of the market vendors in Sandpoint had this up at their booth and it's a, it's a perfect one. But really when it comes to a farmer's market, it's important that you think about the fact that you're not only selling your produce and your product, it's about establishing and creating a relationship with your customers. And a part of that by showing them and sharing them photos of your farm. And it doesn't have to be a big photo album, just a couple pictures would, would do. But that gives a connection that you're more than just a product that you have in hand. That they can, if they can see photos of your farm, photos of your animals, whatever you happen to be selling, that's, that's a really nice way to give them more of a perspective that you actually grew this, you actually created this, and it's not, um, it's not a grocery store. And people come to the farmer's market because they want to create, they want to have a relationship with the farmer that grew the food. Having handouts and, and flyers to explain your production methods are really good things. And, and recipes are absolutely indispensable handout for customers. One of the things that um, I, I think it's really important that you, uh, when you do your walkabout and look at what other people are doing, that's, that's really look at what you like. I mean, when you walk around different farmers markets, and I encourage you to do that, go to at least three with a notepad, make note of what, what do you like about that particular booth? What do you like about how those, those farmers have set up their display? What, 
what makes it interesting to you, what appeals to you. And then um, know that that is what draws the customers in, how, how it's designed, how it's displayed. We go for a, a country look. So I, I have, you can see I've got, this is my display. I've got chickens on the, on the tablecloths and, um, well, actually this is at my farm stand, but having a, a personal touch and being unique with your display really makes a difference. This is when you think about the configuration and your display options, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. Pack River Farm are, um, they took the cultivating success workshops some years ago and have been very successful at the farmer's market. They ended up, when I retired from the farmer's market after 28 years, they actually took my spot and the U shape is what we've always used at the farmer's market. Well, not always, but for most of the years, this, this configuration. But as time went by, I realized when, the, when you have a lot of shoppers there, this shape can be limiting to how many people can get into it. So with our booth, we actually ended up tilting those tables, tweaking those tables out so it allowed more room for people to access because if you have a couple people in there then other people can't get in so you really want to think about how the flow is how many people can get into your market space so this is a standard u u shape and a lot of people use this tablecloths are, are really great for hiding what's under the tables and i think uh, one of the things that people were always saying and listening to my customers, people are always coming by and wanting to take pictures of our display. And that's really a part of why people come to farmer's market is to see the beautiful produce, but they also want to have a relationship with the farmer that grew the food. And a part of that is something that we, we need to do and create by how we display what we have. I took this off the Pack River Farm website, and um, this is just using two tables instead of three, which is a nice, nice way to do it. And it's more open up and allows for easy access. And you can see that on each of the items that they have there, they have their farm name. And I think that's a, a really important thing that if you don't, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute here, but there's a lot of different ways that you can go with designing your farm booth. But one of the things you need to think about is if you're going to be using a scale. And if you're gonna be using a scale, you need to determine whether you're selling, um, where you're gonna put that scale. Are you going to let the customers use the scale, which I kind of, would um, suggest that you not do that because they the scales can be pretty sensitive. So we always had our scale set off to the side. And for probably after, of 28 years of selling at the farmer's market, I'd say half the time I used a scale. The first, the first half, I never used a scale. And then I switched to a scale and it made a lot of things easier for me, but for, years we just sold by the bunch or by the bag and um, set price points so people could, you know, three for a dollar, two for a dollar, what, whatever, something like that. So you can do with a scale or without, but no, if you use a scale, you need to, it needs to be a certified scale. I thought it was interesting when I was looking over all the pictures that I had from the farmer's market that the, the two bare bones uh, displays were both bill. <laughs> Bill's, both of them called Bill's Garden, and um, they no tablecloths or anything. But these these guys, um, Bill on the right, sold. He was one of the original vendors at the farmers market and sold there for about 15 years before he retired. And Bill on the left um, sells to supplement his social security, and and he always has a, a nice offering, and it's pretty pretty basic. So you can see that it can be any number of ways. You can 
add some country charm to it, or you can do a bare bones approach. And one thing about the markets are farmers markets are happening rain or sun or sleet or whatever. So you need to think about some kind of cover. And the, while we have an easy up, we have several easy ups actually. And I experimented with easy ups over the years at the farmer's market, but while they're easy up, they're, they're just more time. And um, some farmer's markets, you, they limit how you attach an easy up to the ground. So uh, you, you might have to use some kind of weights to hold it in place. You're not allowed to put stakes in the ground. And of course, if it's in a parking lot, you're not gonna do stakes. You're gonna do some kind of weighted material. So we opted to use the big umbrellas and they mostly were to provide a little bit of shade. During the summer months, we would move those umbrellas around and more than anything, it gave us something to stand under if it was raining. But if you use an easy up, that's a nice, nice way to go. It just takes more time to put it up or down. Using baskets on the left and, and the baskets are kind of layered, that's a nice way to double the amount of space that you have. And using baskets and boxes, and you can see the one on the right, they've covered some boxes with a tablecloth so they could get a nice bountiful look to the display. And really having an attractive display makes a huge difference for bringing people in. And so you need to give some thought to that. And if you're a first time farmer's market person, I encourage you to take the time to set up your display at home and um, kind of play around with it so you can figure out what the process is and, and give yourself plenty of time when you go to set up at the market for the first time, because <clears throat> it does take some time if you want to um, have it look pretty. I like this, this simple display. It's a small card table. He's using wooden crates to double the amount of space. And you can see it's very clear that he takes credit cards. He's got a price list sitting down on the table top, which um, rather than putting prices on everything, and, and there's business cards there. There's, um, he's got a, a plethora of different sizes of honey that you can take for different price points. This is uh, Mountain Cloud Farm and they're their motto is from Clark Fork to your fork, providing fresh, high quality, chemical free produce. And the having a well stocked display really does make a difference, but doesn't have to be that way, but you don't have to put everything out at once, especially if uh, as it goes into the hot summer months, things start wilting and you really have to consider that. And that's, that's another good reason to have a canopy or an umbrella or something to offer some shade. But um, once, you, once it starts getting hot, it, it's pretty challenging to keep things crisp and fresh. So uh, we always kept uh, a, a couple of spritzer bottles so we could go out and spray things down and keep them moist, but there's some other things that you can do to keep things fresh, fresh looking. But the idea is you can, if you, if you bring a lot of product, you don't have to put it all out. You can keep restocking, keep, keep things in coolers in the back and keep restocking as time goes by. So one of the things I realized when I was putting this together that, um, Marketing, when you think about marketing your products, whatever that is, it's the, the whole idea is to um, acknowledge that you are a, an important part of marketing your products. And it's really important that you are greeting all your customers with a friendly smile. And one of the things I, I put this in there because for me, after 28 years at the market and the last two years that I was there, 
I was injured and in a, in a lot of pain and not very um, happy about being there. And I didn't have the greatest attitude. So fortunately, Alicia Best, who was an intern with us in 2003 and sold with me at the farmer's market for the last six years that I was there, would, was smart enough to tell me to go around back and sit down and um, leave the selling to her. And at our farmer's market, we have a rule that the person that grew the food has to be there. You can't hire an employee to come and sell your products. So having uh, a, a friendly smile is pretty important. And when I was, when there was a point where I wasn't very friendly, that wasn't such good marketing. So, and I put this note in here about cleanliness and neatness and cheerful service, and that you should also look presentable and clean. And it, it seems like a no brainer. However, um, over the years, some of some folks at the farmer's market, not, not uncommon to see, they, they look like they just came out of the field. They've got dirt all over them. They haven't combed their hair. They come, there were, there were a couple, couple folks over the years that would come barefoot and their feet are all muddy and dirty and um, their display didn't look very clean. And I mean, they had beautiful products, beautiful produce, but it wasn't clean. And um, they were often complaining that they weren't getting the, the prices that they did and the, that they wanted, but they weren't willing to wash their produce and they weren't willing to clean up before they got there. So it's really important that you think about what's going to appeal to the buyer. And a part of that is that you are presentable and clean and that you at least change your clothes before you come to the farmer's market. A lot of, a lot of folks wear aprons to stay clean, but um, a customer is not real likely to be wanting to grow up, buy food from you if you're not uh, particularly presentable. And it's important throughout the market, because most markets are open for four or five hours, that you at least every half hour, if you can, walk around the front of your booth and look back at your display often and look for coffee cups, rearrange things, people will leave things there. You want to keep things looking full and keep things looking tidy because that really attracts the customers. I think signs are a really important part of your market booth. It's really the signs and I mean, what your display looks like is really important, but the signs are also something that your customers as they're walking by, I mean, why, why are they going to choose you over the other 20 vendors or 30 vendors or wh whoever are there. So I, I like this handmade sign that Muskrat Hill Farm took and they actually also went through the Cultivating Success Small Farms program some years ago. So it, it's really important that you um, think about different ways of marketing what you have and, and signs are a good, good way to do that. You can hardly see that one on the left. It's organic heirloom lettuce. And of course, if you're certified organic, you want to advertise the heck out of that. So over the over the years of listening to my customers, and uh, I always keep a notebook at the farmer. Uh, always kept a notebook at the farmer's market. I always keep a notebook at my farm stand now. And I listen to customers and I can't tell you how many people would come in, just they'd read my signs, give peas a chance. Oh, isn't that cute? Or all beans are not created equal. And people would come in just because of the signs. So it, you know, for the most part, as people are walking around, especially if you're dealing with customers, they're looking at your display, they're reading your signs and that's something that brings them in. So whether they're, I, I do them on the computer, but, um, or, or I used to, I, I now do them by hand, but here's some more signs. I love the advice signs. And that was 
I, I taught a workshop in Nevada some years ago on small farm marketing and you got, got to tour some of their, or one of their farmers markets in Reno. And one of the farmers had an advice sign. And she said, just having that sign there, that a lot of people came in just for that because they thought the sign was fun. If you have something special for Mother's Day gifts, I mean, that's that's a wonderful thing to do and promote things. I like this other one, cosmetically challenged spuds. And um, she's got the little spud man there moving around. And the, the spud man, he seemed, that was a, a, a vendor that sat up next to me for a while. And the kids would always come in to see the little potato guy and, and the parents would end up buying because of the kids like the potato guy. And then I put this sign in for Meowie Wowie, which is a catnip that we've been selling for many years. And I don't know if you can read that. It says only the highest quality catnip flowers are harvested by hand with love and sun dried for cats with distinguishing taste who deserve the best. So we, that's been a, an interesting thing of market assessment for us after selling at the farmer's market, I sold pounds of Meowie Wowie every year. And now that I'm doing a farm stand, I hardly sell it at all. So the tourists really liked the Meowie Wowie. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention regulations. And I, over the years, so many times I would see people come to the farmer's market for the first time and set up and they would set up without um, taking the time to review the regulations. They'd get all set up and then the market manager would come around and go, well, um, you can't sell that here. So I encourage you do you have some good ideas for selling at the farmer's market that's beyond produce for value added products or um, any number of things? You really want to be familiar with the produce safety rules and know what kinds of things, if you're gonna do samples, what kind of foods you can actually put out there for samples. You need to know the health department rules and you don't need to memorize them, but you need to be familiar with these things because Say, saying you didn't know just means you're going to invest a lot of time and money into something that, that is not going to bring you equity back. And when it comes to farming, it's really about sweat equity. It's what I call it because you put all this time and energy into producing, growing a product and you want to sell it. You want to get something back. So in the sign here, uh, and, and for meat, if you're selling meat, it has to be USDA inspected. And um, this is Tony Carey of Four Seasons Farm. And she does a lot of pre-order for her meat products and usually sells by the quarter or the half or the whole hog. But um, she also does chickens. But you have to be, there's, there's regulations associated with that. So just be, take some time to review these things and be, become familiar. So you, you don't want to invest a bunch of time and money into something that's, that you turn around and say, well, I didn't know. Well, whether you knew or not, it could be um, not cost effective. So that's something for you to consider. Signs and banners are really, it's really important that you, if you don't have a farm name with your display, that's, that's fine, but you, you want to personalize it in some way. And over the years, over the many years of being at the farmer's market, because people knew who I was, because I always had Green Tree Naturals up in front so people would remember who we were. I was always handing out cards, postcards with recipes on them, postcards with our name on them, business cards. Um, and people would call me and, and say, well, 
I bought something from that guy that's like three tables down from you and he's he's got a bunch of garlic and um, beans and and I, I since I knew everybody at the farmers market I could tell them who that was but the reality is they if you want your customers to be able to follow up with you and buy more later you, you need to have a name so um, think about that and whether it's just the flower lady or bill's garden that works and this photo on the left paradise valley organics that's sora huff she's no longer there at the farmer's market in bonner's ferry but they sell out of the back of their vehicles there but she's got a beautiful display she's got the name of her farm on on a banner over overhead you can see how she's her display is nice and attractive things are kind of leaning up and that's one of the things when you do your walkabout looking at different markets look at what attracts you to different vendor space and and do something like that but something different and personalize everything put your name on everything that you can because people I mean, they'll, they'll buy from you and they'll buy from five other vendors and they get home and they have something and they don't, they can't remember who they bought that from. But if you have, even if you just do an address label with your name on it, they, then they can, if that's, if it's in a bagged product type thing, or, or whether you put it in a paper bag or you put your business card in with whatever they're buying, that way they'll know where it came from and they can call you and order more and that really makes a difference and i know that business cards can be uh, a, a challenge to create but there's a lot of different programs out there to help that are pretty simple for making a simple business card and that's a way of providing an option to stay in touch with your customers for them to order more and here Tony Carey, who took a small farm marketing class from me years ago when she first start, started out. I mean, great. We've got, we know it's Four Seasons Farm. We know what her name is. And so it's not that lady with the, uh, with the meat at the market. It's got, they, they remember who she is. They remember her name. So that's a really important thing to think about. So here's a couple of displays of baked goods at the market. You can see the one on the right, they've got their farm farm name. We've got a nice tablecloth. We've got several different levels, which is a really good thing for um, getting a lot on a, on a small space. And the one on the left, she's got ingredients on all of her baked goods. So, because people are, a lot of people are, are intolerant of different types of food products. So that's a, a, a important thing to do. And that, that lady sells, she sells a lot of pies, a lot of baked goods. And so it doesn't matter whether you're doing produce or baked goods or soap or whatever you choose to do at the, the farmer's market, there's a, a good place for that but the information the more information you have there because you think about how the customers are and not every customer wants to ask questions they they like to be able to read what the ingredients are and if you have a if if the market pace is moving pretty quickly you can't really stop and answer all those questions so that's where the signage is pretty important for ingredients that type of thing so um and whether you print it out or write it on a chalkboard or whatever, that's an important thing to do. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a big display. A small table can meet your needs and provide plenty of information for the customer. He's got his farm name across the bottom in front of the table so that um, people can see it from a distance. I love that he's included a picture of the cow if you're selling eggs, have pictures of the chickens. If you're selling, well, you know, I guess it, it, if, if you were selling meat at the market, I don't know if people would want to see, see the cow. They might, um, people most, for the most part, don't want to think about the animal when, the, when it was living. They want to think about it on the barbecue pit. But um, 
he's got the name of his farm. He's got different, all the information there and price points. And he shows that he was been approved by the Idaho Department of Agriculture. The information is important that you put that out there and, and have that. In the, um, for local cheese, this is a, a former intern of ours who started a, a goat cheese business. She's, she's no longer farming anymore, but you can see the, they've got the nice, nice big sign and, and um, samples and on the right we've got more more cheese you can see the cheese is displayed on ice that's an important thing of uh, you need to really think about food safety regulations as you're doing your displays and how you can most meet this the, the needs of your customers and keep things safe and then uh, with the cheese there they've got their logo on the chef cheese and on their jars and on the labels you want if people buy from you and walk away you want them to be able to find you again and even if you just do a return address label on your products on the bag or whatever but get those business cards and put the business card in everyone that goes away so they remember where they got it so keeping things cool and fresh there's a I'm giving you an example of greens. There's a lot of different things that you can do for uh, selling greens. We've got pre-bagged greens and the, the bagged greens on the bottom right there. They are sitting on top of blue ice that is um, covered with a towel. I'm not going to answer that phone. And then we've got a head lettuce in an ice chest that's kept in the back. And then they, they bring the lettuce out individually um, on a protected area. And then here we've got lettuce where you just self-serve. And so there's different ways that you can do a lot of different things. And, and when you're going around the market for the first time and really doing, looking at doing your market assessment of what other people are doing, pay attention to how many vendors are selling lettuce, how many vendors are selling the same thing and see if you can make, do something a little different. That's important. Your Signs are a really important thing. We've got local plants grown from local seeds. That's an important thing to a lot of people. Here, um, Arlene Yakel was at our market in the earliest days. And when she first started coming, she, she was, everybody referred to us as her as the iris lady. And she wasn't selling very many irises at all and, and started, she changed her marketing and started putting pictures of the irises out there and it really made a difference she increased her sales and um, so think about that you got to think about I mean originally I think she was just writing on the on the iris corms what color they were but once she started putting pictures out on on the corms she starts selling them like crazy the more information, the better. You want to make it easy for your customers to read about what you have to sell and provide those shy customers that don't want to ask questions. I love this. That's Tony Carey's display on the left there using a fork for her sign. And then um, on the right, there's just planting instructions and description of the eggplant. And if you're certified organic, you put that on everything so people know. And there are regulations to whether you can use the word organic on a product if it's not certified. So you need to know those regulations. Don't just be guessing at things. Plant sales, this was in uh, Hayden Lake some years ago and she um, is no longer with us, but she had, I, I loved her herb pots. She did um, plastic lined 
half bushel baskets and um, just did a, a remarkable job. Sold, a, sold nothing but herbs. What a perfect name for her farm. It's important that you have prices easy to see. A lot of, a lot of customers don't want to ask how much is this, how much is this. So um, while the display on the left, she's got a price board on the ground and it's great that she's got the price board, but if somebody's standing in front of that price board, they won't know what it is. So it's if you're using a, uh, a chalkboard, get that up where it can up to eye level where it can be seen because it makes a difference and this is we used to do all printed labels and now i do a combination and I, I, I start doing it um this is my display and i start doing it this way with um just chalkboard and it was an easy way to change prices or adjust accordingly And if you're doing flowers, you need to be, they need to be shaded from the, the sun during the heat of the summer. Um, I, for probably seven, eight years, I was the only person doing flowers at the farmer's market and the two bouquets on the upper right are mine. And I, I when other flower vendors started coming, I switched and started recycling my dog food cans and using the cans. So they just walk away with the can, which was a, uh, an e easy sale. And then as the flower growers expanded at the market, I switched and started doing dried flowers. And the thing is that market assessment and reassessing what you do and looking at what what works and what doesn't work. I mean, it changes. I, 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 um, what I've sold at the market over the years has sh shifted and morphed into a lot of different things. So I went from being the only fresh flower grower at the farmer's market to being the only dried flower farmer. And the thing with the dried flowers and thinking about who my customer is, well, here we have a lot of tourists. Well, a tourist isn't gonna buy fresh flowers, but they'll dry, buy fresh dried flowers that don't need water. And if I don't sell them one week, I've still got them the next week. And one of the things that um, I think has been really important part of establishing relationships with our customers, and you need to think about and acknowledge that selling at a farmer's market is really about establishing relationships. Because if you establish a good relationship with your customer, they're going to come back and they're going to choose you again and again. And like I said, when I first started the market, there were 10 vendors. And when I left, there were 60. So why are they going to choose you? Well, I and I, I've always been of mind that it's important to let your customers know how much you appreciate them. So I've always grown a lot of parsley and I keep bunches of parsley and some small herb bunches that I often will give out for gifts. I also keep um, single flowers available that I give out. If somebody buys over $10 worth, I'll give them a single flower. It's, it's important to give special attention to customers that return again and again. And think about it, if you treat your customers well, and you treat them the way you want to be treated and feel special about that, of course, you're going to come back. Of course, you're going to want to support those same people. So, like I said, I retired from the farmer's market after 28 years, and I took all my market tablecloths and turned them into um, skirts for my farm stand and now the farm stand is down at the bottom of our driveway and we only sell one day a week on Thursdays um, from 3 to 5 30 during the peak of the season and I've brought over I, I love that I have my tablecloths that I had at the farm farmer's market for all those years there and it's ended up a lot of my customers from the farmer's market now 
come out to the farm and show their support and have stayed with us over the years. And I love that. I love that it, it continues. And um, I think the farmer's market is a great place to start. And I, I, when I started, I didn't think that I would end up being there for that long, but nonetheless, I did. So I think that's I think that's what I have, and we can open it up for questions. Great, thank you, Diane. I'll encourage everyone that's participating today to go ahead and type your questions into the Q and A box that you'll find in the control bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, to start off, Diane, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you decided where you would put your cash register and how you conveyed to your customers what you took in terms of payment, what types of payment you took. Um, the, the cash box, I kind of set it in the, in the, um, at the farmer's market, I had it back behind the table and I ended up having the scale on one end of my U-shaped display and it kind of was on a, uh, a separate little table all to itself for the cash box. And the important thing was, I mean, after all those years, I, I only had one time that I felt like uh, some, I, I had a a guy that was kind of a grizzly looking fellow that was hanging out way too close to the cash box. And he just stood there staring at the cash box like it was a dog cookie. You know, it was like, well, that's what it reminded me of one of my dogs staring at a, a dog cookie. And it was the only time I ever felt threatened by somebody um, potentially robbing me. I mean, he, uh, I ended up giving him some food and sent him on his way, but uh, it, it's important that you keep your cash box um, back and out of the way. A lot of, a lot of vendors will just wear a, a fanny pack and, and do everything right from there. Um, so there's different ways you can do that, but um, we, we always kept the, just a cash box around the back. And I always had one helper with me so that Alicia Best was with me the whole time and so we could take both be helping add and deal with money and did I answer that? Yes, um, I think that the second part of my question and you did show a nice slide of somebody showing that they accepted MasterCard and Visa. But what about types of payments and what people are expecting in terms of the type of payments that can be utilized at a farmer's market? Oh, right, right. Um, yeah, there was one, the, uh, I think the one, the Masters Moo, they had a sign up that said they accepted credit cards. And now they do have the, the smartphone technology where you can do a, a credit card or debit card slide on your phone. We've always been cash only. And um, I don't know what the percentage is of, of at the farmer's market and it's probably different depending on your, your location as to how many vendors are accepting credit cards or not because it is becoming less of a cash market but um, for a lot of things but um, we do cash or checks and, and we've over over the years of accepting checks i never had a, a a bad check and we accepted checks from people traveling from all over the country. So um, at our farmer's market, food stamps are accepted. And I can't say that I ever had anybody offer food stamps at my booth. Uh, I know that um, a, a lot of the farm, the farmers at the farmer's market do accept food stamps, but we were always known to be a little bit higher than some of the other vendors on some things and a little bit lower than others. I think we were pretty average, but we pretty much did cash only service and, and it's the same at my farm stand. So uh, if I were was accepting credit cards, I would have to increase my prices to make up for the percentage difference. So it's just a, a, 
a choice that you'll have to make. But I think for the most part, most well, a lot of farmers markets are probably 50-50 as far as whether they try accept credit cards or debit cards or cash only. It's just a something that you have to decide what how you want to do that, make that available to your customers. Hey, thank you. We have a couple other questions that have come in. One is, how did you handle more than one person wanting to check out at the same time? Um, they just stand in line. It, it, um, at the, I can say that at the, for the most part, everybody's pretty, pretty patient and willing to stand in line and you can end up with, uh, my lines have actually been bigger at my farm stand than they ever were at the farm's market. Um, the big difference is at the farmer's market, people would come and shop at, you know, they'd want to shop a little bit at, at my stand, a little bit at the next guy's and, and kind of spread their dollars around where when they come to my farm stand, they're coming to buy their week's worth of product. So I have to say my lines have been bigger here and I just, um, I do have signs up that say social distancing and be respectful of each other with COVID happening. I think that's important, but um, people, are, people are pretty, pretty good about standing in line. And, and we have uh, at the farmer's market, we had, even though I had the U-shaped tables, I set one, one corner of it is where checkout was. So people could check out and not block that U shape. And then I kind of opened up the tables a little bit more. So there was access. So for the most part, people are pretty willing or pretty respectful for standing in line. And I mean, I've never had anybody, you know, complain that somebody took cuts or anything. So yep. you just have to be, to thank people for their patience for waiting. Yeah, thank you. And definitely, I think what you mentioned about COVID and social distancing, I think many markets are still going to have some signage up this next year and maybe some different protocols in place. So definitely checking with your market about if you have to accommodate that within your booth design or if they're going to provide some type of markers to help your customers understand where where they should be standing in line and how they should be approaching your booth. Right, and even at my farm stand, um, you can see it's still kind of the U shape. So when people, uh, I'd only allow a couple people in there and um, at, at a time and uh, every now and then, if it got, if too many people came in there, if, if, if three or more came into that space in my farm stand, I would remind them and I'd, say, I'd just say, would you mind, one of you needs to step back and and let's re respect each other and keep the social distancing going and i've never had anybody argue with that so okay thank you another question is have you ever experienced anyone trying to steal product from your farm stand mm, uh <laughs> kind of <laughs> um oh yeah i had at the farms well the other thing with the farm stand is i'm there it's not a self-service stand i'm when i'm open i'm there so and i'm only open one day a week from 3 to 5 30 so it's a narrow window but um i i had one one instance where a woman was arguing with me about wanting to take a bunch of garlic saying that she would bring me the money tomorrow and I wouldn't let her do it. And she kept arguing with me and I finally just had her leave. But for, for um, other than that, um, I kind of inventory everything that goes out. And um, I think at the farmer's market, I had one instance that I was aware of that someone took something. And my feelings are for food wise, you know, if, if in the times, there were a few times in Sandpoint at the market where there'd be someone that looked like they were pretty destitute and um, like the guy that was staring at my money box for 15 minutes and I just gave him some food and sent him on his way. And um, I think uh, that has not been an, an issue. And so it, it's important to keep an eye out and pay attention because the thing is we all, 
as growers, we, we work a lot of hours. There's a lot of time and money investment and sweat equity into growing the crops that we have to sell. And whether you're doing crops or baked goods or whatever that is, it's important that we um, ha have, have an income back from that because we're not doing this for nothing. So, Absolutely. Um, another kind of similar question that came in is, have you dealt with people who sampled products without permission? Uh, um, I, uh, I, I only had one encounter and it was a sampling with permission and, and it was, um, I don't think we have enough time for that. That was the back away fat boy story. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I've never had anybody sample anything without permission. I, I, for the only things that I have samples of and sampling is a really good thing to have, but you need to follow the, the produce safety rules on that. But like for, I always have um, baskets of cherry tomatoes, for example, and, and I will always have a sample of cherry tomatoes available so people can, and I encourage them to taste them. So different things like that, as far as tasting, I'm, if, it, if it's something that's tempting, I try to have samples available, but you also need to be aware that there's limitations of what you can have, have out there for sampling, but I can't say that that has been an issue, no. Okay, great, thank you. And something thinking about in terms of like sampling or how you package your products maybe, um, we have a question about where do you get your packaging supplies? For instance, like your bags that you use for greens and other products. Um, we switched to um, biodegradable, compostable bags a couple of years ago, which really, I mean, they're not cost effective. I, it just drives me nuts that, that if it's, if it's biodegradable or compostable, uh, compostable, it costs twice as much. It shouldn't be that way, but it is what it is. And um, I bought a, uh, I'd, I'd have to look that up and I could, we can always follow up with an email to anybody I, I couldn't tell you where I ordered those bio bags and um, over the years I, I used to order rolls of bags and I still do but you can you can order uh, produce bags usually from um, restaurant supply type places or um, as time has gone by, I've experimented with a lot of different things. And um, if you can get them wholesale, all the better. But I can't say that I have one particular place because even if you find a good place on a roll of bags, the shipping will in, it is so high that it, it increases the cost. So um, I, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head, but um, most, of, most of those type supplies we get through a restaurant the local restaurant supply place, which you, I'm sure wherever you are, there there is one of those. So look for restaurant supply. And if you're looking for uh, biodegradable bags, that's something else or, or containers. We've, we've switched to uh, using more paper bags as much as possible for things like tomatoes and trying to back away from plastics, but it's pretty hard to do. And, uh, you line I guess you line is a place that I use for a lot of different sizes of bags it just depends on what size of bags that you want but there's a, a, a lot of resources out there but restaurant supply or you line I guess are probably my two go-to places great thank you and that was all the questions that we had. I really appreciate your taking the time to answer those and sharing your experience and your resources. And if it comes that we can find the contact information for the bio bags, we can definitely post a link to that supplier with the webinar recording. And this slide is showing you that you can find the webinar recording on the Cultivating Success website at Recorded Webinars. 
We are also really hoping that you'll take a few minutes, about three minutes, to provide some feedback on today's webinar. And you can do that by going to the evaluation link that is going to be sent to you in an email tomorrow. Or you can um, answer it when it automatically launches in your browser just following the webinar. We do have a large number of COVID-19 resources, some very specific to farm stands and farmers markets and other direct marketing avenues. You can find those at cultivatingsuccess.org under the COVID resources tab. We have two more webinars in this year's webinar series. So next week, we're really excited to be talking about three steps, a three-step marketing method to keep your customers flowing in. Emily Black with Cultivating Your Market and Lone Mountain Farms and Athol will be our presenter. And then on April 22nd, we're switching gears a little bit and I will be talking about unpacking and planning for the true costs of owning and leasing farmland. All of our webinars have been recorded. They are available from the Cultivating Success website. And of course, you can register for the two upcoming webinars. In your evaluation, please let us know what other topics you would like us to cover. We will do this webinar series again next year. And with that, we're going to be looking at the evaluations that you have provided and going through the topics that you said you would like to learn more about. Again, thank you so much, Diane, for joining us today, for all of you that have participated in today's webinar, and we hope to see you next week to talk about a three-step marketing method to keep your customers flowing in. Have a really great day. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>